and welcome to making music. I'll tell you, that's great music. We love that. Well, we're lucky to have with us today three people that are closer to really the Gretsch guitars. And uh, on my right here is Art Wiggs. Art, been with us for about 30 years in and out of Guitar Showcase. And you run your own company, Wings Guitar Products. That's right. A competitor, but a friendly one. Right, right in San Jose. And uh, you've been Mr. Gretsch to me for, gosh, I don't know how long, about 30 years, give it's or take. Been, it's been both ways, Gary. Yeah, and, it, uh, and it's been great. I know you've helped us out a lot. And then to your right, we got Mike Lewis, who's the marketing manager for Gretsch Guitars. Yes, sir. And uh, now you've been doing this how long with Gretsch? Uh, with Gretsch, about three and a half years, sir. About three and a half years, but you've been with Fender for? 16 years. 16 years, okay. And then on your right, we have the famous Jeff Bowen, who's our regional sales manager for Gretsch Guitars and some other Fender products. And how long have mm -hmm. you been doing this? Uh, I've been with Fender 14 years. 14. And, uh, uh, in the guitar business, I guess about 25 years. All right. Yeah. So we've got, God, we've got a lot of experience here between us, don't we? Over the century mark. We don't even want to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> so, you know, we've got, we've got a lot to talk about today with Gretsch Guitars, and it's a rich history. Let's, let's start way, way back and uh, uh, Mike, you're probably the guy. I know you're, you're Mr. Gretsch, and, and, and you too, Art. Uh, but to go way back to 1883, and it's Friedrich Gretsch, right? Was his, he was a German immigrant. Yes, tell, us, tell us about how this all came Well, came Friedrich out. came over uh, and immigrated to the States, into Brooklyn, New York. And he took a job with a small manufacturing company that made uh, banjo parts, drum parts, tambourines, and toy musical instruments. And uh, shortly after that, he decided that he could do just as a fine a job as this outfit that he was working for. So he founded the Fred Gretsch, or excuse me, the, the Gretsch Manufacturing Company, and uh, continued to make the same types of products. And uh, shortly after that, just a few years later, he went on his first business trip back to Germany, took a boat, because back in those days, he had to take a boat. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, the first word that his family got back from him was that he had mysteriously passed away and had been buried. And so on, his, huh? his, his widow, um, Mrs. Gretsch, had a decision to make. She needed to decide whether to sell or liquidate this business or turn it over to their 15-year-old son, Fred Gretsch, who has become uh, known as Fred Gretsch Sr. Now, Fred Gretsch was the one that took us into the 20th century. He, he built the building uh, on Broadway and got us into you know modern instruments and so on and so forth. And when the uh, by the time the electric uh, the guitar came along for Gretsch in the 30s, uh, his son Fred Gretsch Jr. was at the reins. So that's kind of kind of the start. Kind of the start, yeah. They uh, they started in guitars, and when the electric guitars came along in the 40s, uh, that was also a big milestone for Gretsch. But when the 50s came and Chet Atkins became an endorser for Gretsch, that's when things really, really made a, like a 180 for them. That's the golden years. The golden years The golden of years of Gretsch. Yeah. Okay, well, some of, the, some of the guitars, well, let me get it in perspective, first of all, for the old days. Um, one of the oldest was Martin at 1833, then we've got Gretsch at 1883, and uh, probably the second oldest then, and unless, I don't know when Gibson was around, but they were around in the old days. But right. then Fender didn't come along until the 40s. 46, right. 46. So one of the oldest, really. And, and again, same, same story, immigrant coming over to America and, and you know, starting a company. So his 15-year-old son had to take over the company, what, in about 1890, give or take? Yes, early 90s. Yeah. <clears throat> and, and actually did a job of running it for how many years? Did a huge job. Uh, I believe it was sometime in the 40s when his son took over. 42, I see, yeah, 42. Yep. That's amazing. And that's a, right around that time is when they started, when the electric guitar started to happen. Uh -huh. uh, it was a totally new thing. And um, like I said uh, earlier, by, by the early 50s, when uh, they found Chet Atkins to be their artist, that's when things really changed for them. And um, ever since then, it's been uh, just a, a landmark brand. The, the guitar has been used on so many recordings so much music has been written on it. Uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty unbelievable. Yeah, there's some, I've got a couple of pictures. If we could get in on a, on a shot in here, I'll get a, I'll get a shot. Here's a, here's a guitar lessons uh, shot. Learn the Chet Atkins way for what, for 298? Yeah. You two can play the guitar for 298. That would have been early 60s. Early 60s. Well, Chet was a young man and the guitar he's holding is, 
is similar to the one you've got in your hand. It's uh, It was the country gentleman, I believe. Is that right, 6122. Yes. Is that what it was? Okay. And then a uh, couple couple others I have in here I'll, I'll dig out. Here was a, a later country gentleman. What is that a 6122 also? Yes, that's out of the 70s. Okay. And that's kind of a caricature of Chet up there in the in the corner and that that's it goes way back. Now, w then we then we went forward from there to what the Baldwin years, kind of the dark ages. Now tell, tell us Art, you were you were around then and I was around then. It was in uh, Boonville, Arkansas. And uh, <clears throat> Actually, the Baldwin guitars were very good playing guitars, and they performed very well. Uh, they never got the notoriety, or they never took off exactly the way they thought they were going to. But as far as performance, they were very good guitars. Uh, they had changed the, the uh, frame of the guitar, the body, and, and some of those areas like that. They still use the Filtertron pickups and the Hilotron pickups. But uh, the plant burned down in, uh, I believe it was the late 80s, and then Fred Gretsch Jr. took back over the name of the, of the, the Gretsch name again. Okay, well tell us about those Filtertron pickups, because Mike, that's kind of, I know you have had to replicate. <laughs> that's, that was your job. You, you kind of took over the job and they said, Make it like it was, right? Exactly. Okay, the uh, magic man. <clears throat> when we took over uh, the distribution for Gretsch, uh, three and a half years ago, uh, one of the first things that I did was to determine what the Magic Gretsch recipe was. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not just the, the pickups, it's not just the wood, it's not just one thing, it's the whole thing. And the pickups were just part of it. Uh, but specifically on the Filtertrons, uh, by the way, Filtertron stands for uh, filtering out the electronic hum. That's what uh, the name stands for, and Gretsch is famous for having very cool names for things. <laughs> um, but uh, in the, in the mid-50s, uh, Chet Atkins was working with his friend Ray Butts, uh, who is a gentleman that uh, he, he built the amplifier that Chet used that had the built-in echo and so on, and quite, a, quite a, an electronic genius. He asked Ray if he could develop a, a pickup that had really high fidelity sound, uh, very clear sounding, but didn't have the normal 60 cycle hum that was associated with the pickups of the time. Because uh, back in those days, pickups were all single coil. So <clears throat> Ray developed this pickup uh, that used two coils. They would cancel the hum. And uh, he didn't know this, and neither did Chad or Gretsch, that uh, Gibson was working on the very same concept with a guy named Seth Lover. And they came out with a, uh, with a humbucking pickup uh, right around the same time in 1958 and uh, there was a lot of controversy as to who was really first and whose idea it was but we don't care because our pickup if you can zoom in on this our pickup is the coolest looking pickup by all that, means, that, by well, all means. Is yes it cool is <laughs> well, one more thing i might add to that mike in 1958 they used the long pole screws where you get the good magnet pull and right. you and i have talked about that before yeah and uh, to go away from the seven eighths sure screws in the 60s and you know, it, when they did the Filtertron pickup, other changes to the guitars came about at the same time, because it was all part of a system, you know, like a torque flight system on a, on a Cadillac. You know, it's all one thing as opposed to individual things. And that would include the bracing in the guitar, the trestle bracing that connects the top and the back together, and the tone switch circuit. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they had you know, gone from the tone control to a tone switch to allow uh, the pickup, all the frequencies to come through, which achieves that really high fidelity, super bell-like tone, uh, which has come to be known as the Great Gretsch Sound. So this is a this is a reincarnation of what an old 6122. Well, this one here is a is a 6120. It's a Brian Setzer model, and Brian Setzer, uh, he he played a, a 59. Uh, his first 59 he got for a hundred dollars. And when he took it home, he went, when he went to pick it up, it was in a box, basically. A it basket was case. A basket <laughs> case, definitely. And he put that guitar back together, and throughout the years, he did quite a few modifications on it to suit his own style and so on. And uh, some of those uh, modifications include the, the locking machine heads, which you can see here that uh, have a little locking device that lock the strings in place. Mm -hmm. It helps for uh, tuning stability and makes it really uh, simple to change the strings down here. He also took away the zero fret that was on the original 59 and installed larger frets. 
and um, put on a uh, uh, what's called an adjustomatic bridge, that's commonly known as a tunomatic, uh, for uh, you know individual string intonation, and the bridge is fixed to the top, so it doesn't slide around. It's not floating. You know, because back in the day, uh, the way people played is very different than the way they play now. I mean, you know, people played similarly, like I just was doing a minute ago. gentle, but you know, these days people pound on the guitar, they right. jump up and down, they play behind their head, do all kinds of crazy stuff. Pluck you up know. on the strings. Yeah. <laughs> pull it out of the bridge. <laughs> totally. <laughs> and you know, so uh, the original bridge was just floating to the top, you know, and the only thing holding it on there was the pressure of the strings. Mm -hmm. So the modern one here has two little pins that come up from the top and insert into two small holes under the base, keeping the bridge stable. They hold it in there. Still yeah. giving you the sound of the floating bridge. Right. And other modifications that Brian did was the strap locks and, uh, and a very few other cosmetic things. But it's, it's probably, probably uh, the closest thing to a 59 up until now, because we just recently released the 1959 reissue. He yeah. still has a sound post in there? Uh. This has the trestle bracing, mm -hmm. where it's, it's two pieces of uh, spruce they come up from the, the back and across the top and down, touch the back again. On and they go side back the up in there. Yeah. Well, yeah. now Jeff has in his hand my personal favorite guitar. The original uh, 59. From the, from the Guitar Showcase collection. That's an original. If we can get a, a close-up of that, that's actually the guitar that they replicated. That's an original 59. Uh, 6120, Chet Atkins, and that's, that's the first one he basically put his signature on, right? The 6120. Yeah, yeah 6120. In, in late 54, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so some of, some of the changes that they made uh, to this guitar were for Brian Setzer. Right. But now you have replicated. Jeff, tell us, tell us about the, the actual process of replicating that exact guitar to today's incarnation. Well, we do a... Um um, Mike will tell you we do a process called reverse engineering where we actually will look at old guitars. This would have been a perfect example because this, this matches up perfectly to what we just came out with. We reverse engineer it in every detail to where, um, uh, you know, we take measurements, thickness of the top, thickness of the back, where the bracing is. As a matter of fact, at one time, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but Brian Setzer brought some guitars to Scottsdale and we actually push them through the uh, uh, MRI machine at Scottsdale Hospital. Uh, what that did was give us exact uh, detail, in, oh, every inch or so of every exact, millimeter. every millimeter of how, how that guitar was actually constructed. You did a digital blueprint of it. Exactly. exactly. We did. And um, <laughs> no. when we took this out of the case today, out of the glass case, a guitar showcase, uh, I think Gary said it hadn't been played in 10 years oh, or so. Probably at least, yeah. Uh, it feels identical to what we're doing as a is the reissue. So you've got it I, I just am absolutely comfortable with this or the reissue. They, there, I couldn't tell the difference if I had the other one in my hands. Really would be hard to tell. Well, uh, and this is a great guitar. I just wonder, Mike, how, how did you guys come to find somebody that would put that in an MRI machine? <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> two of them. I mean, I well, I, like Jeff of. said, uh, Brian Setzer came to visit one day and we were talking about this guitar, his mm -hmm. signature model and uh, the changes that he wanted to make to it. And one of the things he wanted was the trestle bracing. And I said, well, I've got a, I've got a 59 here. And uh, he goes, great, that maybe we can you know, tear it apart and figure out so you can see how the bracing was done. I said, I don't think we're going to tear it apart. <laughs> um, so um, one, of our, uh, my, one of my coworkers there at Fender, uh, Richie Fliegler, uh, he has his personal physician was a guitar nut. Uh -huh. So he called him up and said, hey, there's got to be a way we can x-ray this or something to see how it's built, see the insides of it clearly. He goes, well, let me call you back in five minutes. So he calls back and says, my buddies over here at Scottsdale Medical Imaging, they're guitar nuts too. <laughs> and they would love to have you come down there after hours and they'll run your guitar through a CAT scan. <laughs> so we did. And that's how we got it, you know, uh, got that done. What can you imagine, people, if they'd have walked in and seen that go on? People did walk in and see did it. They? Well, yeah. uh, Mike and I were on the phone one day, and he said, all right, how do you know about all these guitars? I said, like cadavers, you cut them apart, and that's how I did it. That, in the old days, that's in how you did it. In the old days, that's how we did it, and yeah. that's how I did it for Fred Gretsch. 
I'll be darned. Yeah. Because you worked with, with Fred Gretsch. Uh, on a temporary basis. Right. I didn't work for Gretsch, but I own a consignment thing. Right, mm -hmm. right. And then uh, there was another gentleman involved with Gretsch parts and things. Uh, Duke Kramer. Yeah, Duke Kramer. Cincinnati, Ohio. Yeah, is he still with us? or? No, Duke passed away in July of last year. Oh, okay. That's too uh, bad. Duke had been with Gretsch since 1929. Because I remember seeing him at some of the guitar shows and the NAM shows and that mm -hmm. sort of thing, yeah. Yeah, he owned DNF products. Okay. okay and he so. was also in charge of in the Baldwin era in the 70s, I believe, Mike, is that right? Sir? Yeah, he was, uh, I believe, in sales. Yes. And uh, actually, uh, our former uh, CEO at Fender Musical Instruments, Bill Schultz, back in the 60s was a salesman for Gretsch, mm -hmm. and I believe Duke was his sales manager. That's right, yeah. yes. And also with Fred Gretsch, I think in the same, during the same period, was uh, doing some stuff with Duke Kramer at the same time. Yeah. That's pretty neat that, that that went on. So so you've replicated that guitar and uh, right down to every little tiny detail and did it with an MRI machine. Could have called Art and asked him because he's cut it one or two in half. Well, well that's worth We did that too. <laughs> <laughs> that guitar, of course, that's my personal one. I took that in trade at Guitar Showcase in about 1968 or 9. I think I gave a guy $50 for it and trade in. And, of course, in those days, that only sold for maybe three hundred dollars new. I don't know what was it, Art? About that, you're, you're, you're right, correct. Right yes. in there somewhere. And these new guitars that Fender is making now, uh, they're probably the the best made guitars that there is. These in Gretsch's the now? Uh -huh. Yes, the new ones. They're pretty much right on the money with everything they do. I mean, it sounds it sounds excellent. It looks good. It. Uh, I know we sell a lot of them. There's there's some of the different models now. You brought uh, you brought a couple others. What, what else did you bring with us, Jeff? Um, you got a penguin. Yeah, I kind of, uh, there, there's quite a few more over at the store other than what we brought probably three or four times. This is called a white penguin. Uh, uh, different type of pickups on this. These are called Dynasonics, um, a recreation of a single coil pickup. Uh, that, those were the ones they used before the filter trons? Yes, exactly. These single preceded coils, the yes. filter single trons. Coil. It's called the Melita Bridge, which mm -hmm. was actually the first uh, uh, bridge that you could intonate actually without any tools. You uh, use the little knobs on top to get it mm -hmm. where it Actually, uh, it was the first bridge that allowed individual string length for intonation. Mm -hmm. Was that it? correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was that was, so that, was, that preceded the uh, Gibson mm -hmm. right. tunematic or whatever they called it. This theirs. has what's called a Cadillac tailpiece, mm -hmm. which is a very finely uh, milled uh, Piece. Very cool uh, looking too. Oh also, yeah. The 6136 yeah. Falcons and the Penguins also had the rubies and the uh, pearl inlay in the knobs, which is what we've we've recreated. And that you as recreated well. that. I That's don't think neat. they're real rubies at this point, but uh, uh, they certainly replicate. The, they're close. Uh, the now the origin of the uh, penguin is an interesting story. Gary, hand me that uh, dual jet right there. Is this a new one or an old one? This I'm, is a new one. I'm getting lost here. Okay. But. Uh, <clears throat> As guitar uh, in guitar lore, okay. Back in the fifties, the story goes that one day when the when the uh, factory was closed, you know they closed up for the night, mm -hmm. locked the doors. Somebody left a white falcon and a black duojet sitting too close to each other. Uh oh! <laughs> Lights went out. They got to talking. One thing led to the next, and the next thing we knew, we had a white penguin. Okay. <laughs> All right. So it actually says that on the Gretsch website. That tells. We that married story. those guitars, and that's that's cool. So I believe the original Penguins also. There was only 50 of those made, and also the Princess was made in parallel with the Penguins at the time. Okay. That was up through 1963, I believe. Now, have you had any of those in your? Yes, I had a 1960 Penguin. Uh, they sell for quite a bit of money. Uh, I think I sold mine for fifty thousand. About fifty thousand yeah. dollars, Mike. Mm -hmm. So they they've definitely gone up in value. It was one of the rarest guitars on, on the, the planet. Yes. Market. The most sought after guitar, but not everyone can obviously afford one. $50,000. But you can buy a, a reproduction. What's the street price on reproduction? for uh, 2800 2800 Under $3,000? Under $3,000, right. Yeah. Art, I think I'll go for that. I don't, you know, yes. <laughs> that's great. And it looks great. It sounds, now, did you play that one earlier? Were you playing that one earlier? Uh, how about we let Mike play it? Yeah, let's, let's hear it. Now, that has the single coil pickups again. Yes, right? sir, it does. I'll get you in Okay, well, that's, that's interesting because that's a different, that's going to give us a different sound. Okay, loud noise coming, everybody. Yeah, well, oh, it won't be that bad. Just a little plunk. Yeah, these, are, these uh, pickups are called Dynasonic pickups, and they're single coil. And Gretsch used Dynasonic pickups 
because remember back in those days the electric guitar was still a very new thing absolutely and guitar manufacturers were not making their own pickups yet and so what they would do is call up uh, the leading pickup manufacturer at the time which was de Armand uh, by um, that was which was a part of Rao Industries mm -hmm. I believe they were in Ohio as well right yes mm -hmm. and they said we need a, we need a pickup give us the best thing you have and they sent him this uh, de Armand model 2000 pickup and of course Gretsch gave it a name the Dynasonic name another cool name in Gretsch history and it's a very high output uh, strong sounding single coil that um, when played in the bridge position <laughs> very twangy and western sounding. Right, in, in the neck position it can be very warm and right, in the middle position with both pickups on you've got your typical uh, famous scratch. Type of sound, yeah. It's uh, it's it's pretty ultimate, and and white penguins are used uh, as well as any Gretsch guitar, is used for any any type of music, rock and roll, rockabilly, country, uh, even hard rock and heavy metal. That's great. So you guys have, have basically taken it from where it was in the old days, and now we can buy these and go up. Well, Jeff, arm yourself with another guitar because uh, we've only got about four or five minutes to go here, and. Uh, in a minute, I want you guys to, uh, to, to play another song for us, because that's, that's going to be great. Um, so, so is there anything else you'd like to tell us about Gretsch? Like what we're going to do, I mean, you've just told us the, the new 6120 that recreates my baby there is, is coming. What else is happening? Oh, well, you know, we should talk about the uh, new Roundup. We sure. have an example. Of, okay, uh, well, Art, you hold this one. This is, this is the old Roundup here? If we yes. Could, uh, Art, what, what year approximately is that? Probably 55. I'd say okay, 55 Roundup. They originally came with a tortoise pick guard with a bull's head on it, and the bull's head in the headstock, and the body is basically pine on the top here, with a carved in G brand and the belt buckle design. That's neat. With a and uh, the Melita bridge. Yeah. And the Rody Armin pickups. So so. You guys are recreating this also? We currently make a version of this. Uh, it's slightly different. It's a slightly later model, uh, but it does have the, uh, the tooled leather sides with uh -huh. the furniture tacks cool. holding it in. And uh, we actually found the furniture tacks on the internet. Exact same thing. I just bought a bunch of them. And, uh, these them these the same tacks? Yeah. <laughs> Get a look at that. See, there's a, a leather. I, essentially, it looks like a leather belt along the, yep. along the side. And then they put the tacks in the in the uh, to hold it on. And then on the bridge, they actually took an old Gretsch belt buckle down here and <laughs> used it for just ornamentation, I guess. It's just silver soldered on there, Art, or something. Yes, or yes. Is that what it's it is? just brazed on there. And brazed it's got on. a uh, uh, wagon, chuck wagon, uh -huh. and it's got the horses and the cowboys and all that on there. Okay. And uh, it's quite. It's very ornate. That's neat. And it's solid nice brass. I think it's important also to note that uh, you know this guitar appears to be a solid body. Uh -huh, but right? it's and in all the literature they always talk about it being a solid body. Now when <clears throat> back in fifty four when the when the Gretsch solid bodies first came out, like the duo jet I just had in this one, um, for some reason Gretsch couldn't bring themselves to actually make a solid guitar. So they made it so, so they actually made it hollow, just like the penguin here. And put the top over it. I mean, the top is just the same type of top as you would find on a Falcon or a 6120. Okay. And uh, it's just a big old piece of mahogany that's been routed out. That's good. Maybe well, 20 it millimeter makes the side. guitar makes much it sound good. easier to handle. Okay, well, listen, I want to thank you guys for coming on the show today, and let's end with some music. <laughs>
got time for another. Yeah? Give, us, give us a little more. <laughs> oh, give us some of that, that intro very music. Good. I love oh, that sound. Man. That's the great Gretsch sound. That's it. That's it. <laughs> On the spot. <laughs> that sounds great. Hit it again. I got it. 